Okay, good morning everybody. Um, I'm going to talk today about Michael Haneke's Caché, and I'm going to assume that you've all seen the film already, so um, for what it's worth, spoilers ahead. And hopefully I can do this without preempting the discussions that it's likely to provoke for you uh, in seminars. Um, but I'll do my best to help you fit it into the broader context of the director's other work, um, but also the themes that he's developed for this film and how he's done that through the form and style of the film rather than through um, specific aspects of its content. So it seems like um, a reasonable place to begin is the opening shot of the film. The opening shot is on screen for almost exactly three minutes. Um, uh, the only thing that you get to interrupt it are the, the opening titles, which are, are overlaid. And you might think of this initially as an establishing shot. Um, that's the term we use for a shot, which sets the scene for you, lets you know this is where the action is going to take place. Um, and it's usually from a distant view, and then subsequent shots will take you closer to the people and activities that are going to occupy the rest of the film. But as the camera holds on this image, even after the opening titles, it exhausts that function as scene setting and becomes something else. Uh, you might initially have mistaken it for a still image. Um, you might not have noticed the film's star, Juliette Binoche, leaving the house. Um, you almost certainly didn't predict that what you might really be seeing is the point of view of Georges and Anne watching the video that has been sent to them in the post. So what you think is your kind of window on the scene is actually somebody else's point of view as they watch this tape. Um, so we might think of this as a point of view shot, but the question that the film immediately sets up is whose point of view it is. Um, and just to prove that there is nothing you can't use Jurassic Park to illustrate, um, here we have a, a series of shots uh, of people looking. The usual um, expectation is that you get um, a shot coupled with a reverse shot. Um, and at the beginning of Caché, you never get the reverse shot. You never get uh, a shot to show who is looking. It's constantly withheld from you throughout the film. So when we see a point of view shot in the cinema, or any shot that shows somebody looking at something, we are trained, um, and I use that word deliberately, we're trained to expect a reverse shot, a subsequent image that will show us who is looking, what they're looking at, or who is looking back at them. So a shot of somebody um, looking at something is almost invariably coupled with the shot of what they're looking at. This is a convention of film style um, that makes these kinds of shots work together. Um, and it, I guess it denies, uh, in cachet, it denies the viewer that ingrained um, payoff that is uh, a part of film language. Uh -huh. um, so even from the beginning, Haneke is already playing with routine behaviours that you might have as, as a spectator. So the Jurassic Park example shows you that um, this is another example of a delayed reverse shot where we see people looking at something and we have to wait for the payoff, but it is very much delivered to us. You know, Spielberg delivers on the promise that we're going to get to see uh, what it was that we paid for. So back to the opening shot, if at first you thought this was um, the film setting out its fictional location for you, you will have been wrong-footed by the revelation that the shot is a material piece yeah. of that fictional world, a shot taken not by Hanukkah, but by a character in the story. And as Guy Austin puts it on the quotation you can see there, um, he creates a disorienting crossover between reading the images before us as subjective or objective. He even twists the knife on his viewers because we do get a kind of reverse shot that isn't part of the video, but it's not from the angle we want. We can see that we're, um, we're looking at the same street, but it's not revealing to us what we want to see, which is that reverse angle looking back up the street so we can inspect for ourselves where we think that camera may have been placed. So we see George come out of the house to try and figure out where the shot was taken. Um, he can't tell, and we're not given um, the clue that he's looking for himself. So this single moment sets out the entire mystery of the film, which will apparently hinge upon the secret of who is looking, 
who is filming, and also what the viewer of the tape is expected to do as a result. But um, Cachet is not a uh, whodunit, the director is, is keen to stress. Um, and if you're focusing on the question of who did it, you're asking the wrong question, he would argue, but because he likes playing games with you. Um, as with this sidestepping of expectations in the opening shot, he wants to make you self-conscious about how you are looking, to sensitise you to um, elements of the frame that you might not usually look at. And you can sense that as that shot holds, it creates um, uh, not an ease within the shot. Oh, it's a comfortable image and it's not changing. Um, it actually is designed to create a sense of, of paranoia or surveillance. So you might think that the driver of this film is that mystery about who's been sending the tapes. And it's perfectly understandable why you might crave that solution. Um, we like to think of the camera as something that reveals, that make things clearer, tells us <coughs> truths, and shows us things the way they were at the point of filming, that there is an inherent objectivity to the camera. So if we had to summarise the overarching project of Hanukkah's feature films, we might say that it has been to disturb those comforts that we might want to take in trusting the image as a guarantor of truth, and also the comfort that we find in knowing that all mysteries will be resolved for us, preferably with a, uh, a happy ending. Um, he's adapted French director Jean-Luc Godard's oft-cited, but actually quite quite glib and uncharacteristic claim that film is truth 24 times a second. Hanukkah reworks that to say that film is a lie at 24 frames a second in the service of truth, or a lie with the possibility of being in the service of truth. Film is an artificial construct. It pretends to reconstruct reality, but it doesn't do that. It's a manipulative form. It's a lie that can reveal the truth. But if a film isn't a work of art, it's just complicit with the process of manipulation. So I draw attention to that last bit. If a film isn't a work of art, it's just complicit with the process of manipulation. He's constantly setting his work up in contrast to this monolithic Hollywood mainstream cinema that he, that he sees. And it's quite a, a problematic claim that he's making there, that there is this kind of simplistic cinema that mainstream audiences are just passively accepting and that his work... Uh, works against that. In another interview, he states again his suspicion of mainstream media. We take reality in the media for reality, which naturally is not reality, but only images of a reality. When we take the news that comes on TV <coughs> as reality, it creates a state of derealization. It has nothing to do with reality. It's completely manipulated and it's false. We're actually deprived of reality. That's the theme of all my movies, and that's the danger. Key word there, I think, is reality, which he wants you to remember. So as you consider how the, this director goes about enforcing this agenda in his films, you might want to question his claims. Is he right to argue that visual media are almost always deceptive, misleading, incomplete, or dangerous? And I don't think he's necessarily talking about the content that they're faking things for us on the news, but more about how the form is manipulated to push us into a certain interpretation. Do his films help us to look differently at what is being shown to us? And if so, how do they represent a programme of re-education for spectators? Um, is this patronising to you as viewers to presume that you've had your critical faculties dulled by years of watching films, TV shows, news and documentaries that have duped you into passive acceptance of their version of events. Okay, how does he set out this thesis of the media's duplicity? Well, he does it not through a, a really essayistic form, but he does it through narrative frameworks that dramatise for us crises of truth, of memory, and in some cases, class relations. So these are, to an, ex to an extent, essay films, but they're built around quite traditional thriller plots. According to Lawrence Chua, Hanukkah's narratives point toward a consumer-driven culture with a naive understanding of violence, a lack of respect for its dangerous, transformative <coughs> power. In a society where basic relationships between people are mediated by images, reality has lost its realness. 
Hanukkah reminds us of this by pulling us into the trick of the spectacle and then exposing the trick itself. He reveals not only how it has seduced us, but in what ways we've been complicit in the seduction. In sharpening our responses to the world around us, he gives us a piece of truth, even as he deprives us of peace of mind. So that opening shot might, might just be nothing. It doesn't point us in the direction of any particular details that might become significant, but by holding the shot longer than expected, Hanukkah plays upon what you might have been conditioned to expect, a cut to something that makes sense of what it is that you're seeing. So he's trying to resensitize you to the act of looking. Now, perhaps that sensitivity that he wants you to have is productive, making us more attentive to important details, or maybe, as I said, it just makes you paranoid. Is there anything significant in the name of the street, Rue des Iris? Is it just a nice name about flowers, or is it a reference to the eye? As um, Ara Osterweil says, extended vision promises knowledge but knowledge, as Hanukkah will soon demonstrate, may be inextricable from individual and collective culpability. And here's where we bring in the other theme of the film, that of national, perhaps specifically post-colonial guilt, and the subject of historical memory. 